So why do systems work so well? And this, this video is me basically going through chapter three from this book. And she has three reasons why systems work so well. One is resilience, the second is self-organization, and the third is hierarchy. And she makes so many really important points in this chapter, so I'm just going to uh, sort of go through each of these one by one. So first, what is resilience? And let me just read her favorite definition. She acknowledges that different fields have different definitions for this, but hers is pretty good. She says resilience is the ability to bounce back or spring back into shape, position, etc. after being pressed or stretched. Elasticity, the ability to recover strength, spirits, good humor, or any other aspect quickly. The opposite of resilience is rigidity or brittleness. And if you ask how do systems actually become resilient, she has an answer to that too, which is that systems have a rich structure of feedback loops within them. So the feedback loops are really key. She also points out that these feedback loops have redundancy built in so that if one part of the system fails or one of the feedback loops doesn't quite work, doesn't quite get the right signal, then there are other feedback loops that sort of kick into gear to make the system work. So redundancy of feedback loops is important, and a lot of times that redundancy is feedback loops that operate under different time scales, where some of them are fast repairing feedback loops and some of them are feedback loops that maybe operate on a, on a longer time scale, like uh, a year instead of a week or a week instead of a day. She also talks about meta-resilience, which is what is sometimes known as anti-fragility in Nassim Taleb's book by the same name. And meta-resilience is basically a system's ability to learn from its mistakes or its ability to learn from negative shocks and negative events so that next time that negative thing happens again, um, the system is better able to handle it. And you might think of allergy shots as a version of meta-resilience, where allergy shots is where they give you a little bit of serum that has uh, dog dander or whatever you're allergic to in it, um, in a small amount the first week and a bigger amount the second week and an even bigger amount the week after that, so that your body develops an ability to recognize that thing you're allergic to and it develops systems for handling that allergy. So meta-resilience is anti-fragility, means the system will get stronger the more it encounters negative shocks. And of course, the, the truth there is that actually, um, in an ideal situation, the system gets stronger at the right pace so that you give uh, people or give systems the, the, the shocks that the system can actually learn from. There's always going to be a shock that is way too big for the system to handle, that will kill the system. So in some ways, a lot of systems will work in terms of um, handling smaller shocks, uh, developing resistance to those shocks, learning from the smaller shocks, and encountering bigger and bigger shocks over time. She points out that systems are dynamic, they're ever-changing, they're ever-moving, ever-responding to things. If a system has static stability, in the sense that it's just stayed the same for a long time, that is actually a very fragile system, and it's unlikely to be able to handle shocks to the system well because it's sort of been stuck and it's lost its dynamic element. And we can even think of this one in terms of war. For example, if you have a country that's constantly in little skirmishes, little wars, where the army has to respond to different things and they have their skills sort of built up for responding to that, that country may be um, better able to handle a bigger war than a country that's just had a long period of peace where nobody has actually experienced real war. She points out that a common breakdown in systems is some kind of breakdown in the information flow or in the signals that are sent that guide the different feedback loops. So distortion of information can cause a system to break down. And I really loved her example of this. She said chronic illness is oftentimes uh, the body's inability to get signals, to keep signals up to date, 
and therefore um, it's basically a weakening of the immune system in the body where the immune system is the series of feedback loops that help our body respond to negative things that happen. When the information uh, signals throughout our body start to be less effective at communicating with other systems in our body, then our immune system breaks down and that can cause chronic illness. And then the last part of this section of the chapter on resilience that was important, I thought, was um, her analogy with the plateau, where she said she thought of resilience as the plateau of situations that a particular system can handle. Um, can it handle only a small area of, uh, of sort of other things that happen, or can it move around on the plateau without falling off? And she said a lot of times people focus on the strategy of a system, which is basically the gameplay on any one given part of that plateau. Whereas resilience is more, it's not about the gameplay in that one section, but it's about can the system move around to different situations on that plateau, different, uh, different scenarios, and operate perhaps using different strategies. So I think if we're trying to imagine the plateau she's uh, she's talking about here. It's a plateau where you might have different rules of the game that are going to, to work differently at different parts of that plateau. And the more um, adaptable a system is, the more easily it can change between one set of rules to another set of rules, depending on the scenarios it needs to respond to. So the second thing about systems that makes them work well is the property of self-organization, which she defines as a system's capacity to make its own structure more complex. And of course, this relates to anti-fragility or what she's calling meta-resilience. It's the ability for the system to sort of reorganize to handle new situations. And of course, our third trait is going to be hierarchy. And there is going to be a little bit of tension between the self-organization property of systems and the hierarchy property of systems because self-organization is actually more of a disorganized process where the system um, has the flexibility to sort of figure out things on its own and to, to build its own structure. And building its own structure will start with chaos, essentially. In this section, she points out the fact that systems will oftentimes fail because they um, aim at short-term goals instead of long-term goals. And they get really caught up on uh, bolstering short-term goals in a way that actually makes the system more fragile and less, uh, less able to organize itself in the future. And when I'm thinking about this, I think about entrenchment, where a lot of times in these large organizations, whether it's a corporation or a government or whatnot, um, they'll, they'll have some situation within the company or with, within the government organization, and they'll put out these rigid rules to handle that particular situation. And sometimes the situation is arising because of a certain personality type that has a certain role and the rules are meant to sort of hold that personality type in check, but it's responding to the specific person in that role rather than thinking about do these rules actually work to serve the organization even when a new person comes into that role. And of course, if you have those rules on the books and if you have people whose job it is to enforce those little rules that were meant to deal with that one person, then when that person retires or moves on, uh, you have this rigid structure that doesn't do a good job of self-organizing in the next phase of the company when you have a different personality type there. So that would be an example of a short-term versus long-term focus where the short-term focus and the rigid structure actually made the system less able to self-organize in the future um, because of the rules. And really entrenchment is the opposite of this. It's, it's uh, making the system so rigid that it cannot self-organize in the future. She also talks about the problem where the system tries to treat people like robots or like algorithms or machines, where it sets up a set of incentives and doesn't allow the people within the system to have their own agency or to work on their own to achieve their own goals. And when it does that, then the system is, is less able to use the creativity and ingenuity that real human beings can have 
when um, they're incentivized a little bit, but given some freedom to do their own thing. The final piece here is the hierarchy, and she argues that systems naturally arrange themselves in hierarchy with systems and subsystems and subsystems to that. Within a body system, there's subsystems that perform different functions, like your nervous system and your liver and your uh, bladder and your stomach. Each of those has its own role. In corporations, the corporation divides down into departments, and that, that would happen naturally if you try to figure out how do we actually function. She points out that when systems evolve hierarchy naturally, a lot of times it's from the bottom up. It's a group of families that live in the same region coming together to form a, a mini city or a mini town, and the group of towns coming together to form a state. And oftentimes the building of that hierarchy is aimed at serving the individual parts so that the individual families, um, they want more efficiency in the way they do farming, and that's why they form into coalitions that become towns. Why is hierarchy so efficient? Well, one of the reasons is it reduces the amount of information that each node needs to keep track of. So that when you divide it into many little parts, uh, you can keep really close track of the people in your little family or your little town, but it would be impossible to keep track of everyone in an entire huge nation and all of their characteristics and traits and economic advantages, all of that. She also points out that there are denser connections between people or between nodes at the smaller level. There's a whole bunch of really intense connections at that smaller level and weaker connections um, going across different systems. So if you look at your body, the cells and the chemicals within your stomach are constantly communicating with other cells within the stomach, but they may not have a, as close a connection with the cells in your foot or the cells in your brain, even though there are some connections. So there's just denser um, channels of communication. There's more, more frequent channels of communication within a smaller subunit. Same thing with the army. You really get to know the other people in your 10 person tent, but you don't get to know everyone in your squadron quite as well. There's just more connections the closer, the closer knit within the system. Now, the last thing she points out is that each little subsystem is going to have its own goals, and those goals may actually conflict with the goals of other subsystems or with the goals of the system overall. And if you think about an organization that has an accounting department, which is trying to make sure everybody, uh, everybody keeps rigid track of things, and a marketing department that's more creative, and the individuals within those systems, they're motivated differently, they're different types, and you could imagine there could be conflicting goals, like the creativity department is going to want a lot of freedom to not have to track every little thing, um, the, the accounting department wants everything tracked and that creates a conflict and those two uh, the, the conflict between those two subparts might might really not help out the overall system the overall corporation so there are conflicts between different levels and conflicts between the lower levels and the higher levels and for a system to work well it needs to align the incentives across the different levels allowing for different motivations at the lower, more minute parts of the system, but making sure that the incentives align. This is obviously one of the biggest jobs of a CEO of a company, is looking at the different parts within the company and making sure they're each properly incentivized to serve the goals to maximize profit for the company.